Hello. All kinds of uh, interesting questions and assertions come up um, in the comments of some of these videos out of the Olivet Discourse. Um, and when I say the Olivet Discourse, I'm speaking really of Matthew 24 and 25. So I thought it would be a good idea to do just a quick verse-by-verse -verse exposition of the Olivet Discourse. And um, it's not going to be a deep dive, but it's gonna, going to be mostly to highlight uh, the context of what's going on and the timing of events and things that's going on. Um, so with that, let me just back up a bit and say, um, the questions that I want to answer, um, come in the nature of, for instance, some of the objections from, uh, the more reformed groups, all mill, post mill, will say, well, the context is I'm speaking to Jews, therefore um, this certain thing here can't be so, or this certain thing over here must be so, because he's speaking to Jews. So because Jesus is speaking to Jews, then this can't be so, and that must be so. And it depends on what you're talking about. So it's a context thing. So audience is what I want to address. I want to address the audience and address also. Um, when he is saying these things and what the context is. And uh, I want to take a look at, at uh, that versus, um, you know, what we will see in Luke, for instance. Uh, Luke has the Olivet Discourse somewhat in there. It's shorter. We see it in, in Mark 13. And um, let's see, there's also um, what happens in this passage. I want to give you the context leading up from the previous passage because a lot of people will insist that um, we of the more premillennial bent will skip the 23rd chapter and that 23rd chapter sets up the context for everything. Well, it doesn't not set up the context for everything, but I want to be, I want to be deferential to those concerns and questions. And so I'm going to back up a little bit and give the context leading into Jesus in the Olivet Discourse. What else am I going to answer here? There are several questions, several phrases, snippets of phrases from the Olivet Discourse that people keep throwing up. Um, he who survives to the end will be saved. Um, no man knows the day or the hour. This generation, this generation must be talking to the Jews. Um, there's key phrases Pick your favorite, and many people coming here will already have their favorite in mind. Um, so I'm going to give you my perspective and how I see this and um, how I understand it within context. So somebody before was asking, you know, what is your hermeneutic? Um, so this is it. We're looking at the audience. We're looking at authorial intent. So what did the author mean? What was he trying to convey when he when he wrote these things, or in Jesus' case, um, he's answering kind of a threefold question. There's kind of really two questions that the disciples ask, but it's threefold, or three-pronged, however you want to look at it. Um, so that's the context, and so obviously Jesus is not writing this here. He is um, speaking it, and Matthew records it in, in uh, Luke, Luke records it, and Mark, Mark, see how that works? So there are different perspectives. Uh, so I want to answer some of those, and I want to look at the context of what's going on, and I want to try to address those. And um, I know there'll be more questions, and there will be more challenges after that. But this all addresses the time of, of tribulation and the time of great tribulation. Uh, some people will say, no, it doesn't. And some people will say, well, yeah, it does. Okay, well, does it or does it it? Let's look at the passage and see. From my perspective, the premillennial perspective, 
if this does answer the tribulation period, or from um, Daniel chapter 9, the 70th week, week of years from Daniel, then those events in an extrapolated form is written out in the book of Revelation. That's primarily what the book of Revelation is about. Please take a look at, at um, some of my other videos here on this channel, on my YouTube channel. There are some playlists. There is an Olivet Discourse playlist that might highlight some different things, but not quite in the flow and in the way I'm doing it here. There is a Revelation playlist from Home Bible Study, sitting in a room with some people and talking and discussing. Um, there is a, a, a couple of videos that are um, under a playlist called Fig Tree, the Fig Tree Generation, and it was answering some specific things about that and, and um, um, another perspective on how to look at that. I'm not going to answer everything right now because there's so many things from the Old Testament that inform the period of time we're talking about. And we're talking about the very last days and how do we know we're at the very last days and what does that look like? Um, the Old Testament addresses it in several ways. The Day of the Lord, and we see that in Joel. Joel is one of the earliest books. Um, and I might go into Joel at some point as kind of some bonus material at the end of this. I've been taking lots of notes and thinking about writing an article on it anyway. When Jesus when Jesus speaks, if you go look at Joel, it's a short book. It's like three chapters. It's one of statistically one of the most neglected, ignored books as one of the minor prophets in the Old Testament. Minor prophets not meaning that it's it's a more of a, a library term, as Chuck Missler would point out. It's more of a library term. It has to do with the size of um, the book. Um, it's one of the earliest of the prophets ever to write. There are earlier prophets, of course, um, put down in the Old Testament, um, in the order of the Old Testament. But in uh, chronologically written down by a prophet, it's one of the very first. But it's one of the most neglected. And Jesus draws on it heavily. When he's speaking here, not necessarily exact quotes, but little key phrases like the fig tree and, uh, um, you know, the olive trees and, and the phrase and all the trees. Um, it's all from the book of Joel. He draws directly from that. And when we look at Joel, which I invite you to do, you might want to do it even before you, you might pause this and go read Joel real quick. It's just three little chapters. Really good, though. It all has to do with the day of the Lord period, the very end times um, going from. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the Jews and the diaspora and being brought back and then uh, judgment on the nations, some judgment on uh, Israel for their unbelief. Um, but then God restoring them is this restoration period and then going into the kingdom and this completed restoration that's going to be happening. So that happens. Um, so let's take a look at this. I'm going to, I'm going to, I might record it all at once. I might record it in a couple of chunks. I don't know. Um, and then I'll uh, break it up into snippets, and I might do a bunch of shorts. Um, I'm not sure yet. Um, we'll see. I'm praying about that. But please have an open mind and look at this. It is easy to um, walk into these things with presuppositions um, from other teachers. And I understand that. You have respected teachers, and you learned a lot from this person um, long ago, or you're learning a lot from this person now. Um, but that doesn't mean everything they say is gospel. We can get some things wrong. A lot of my men that I greatly respect and love, I disagree wholeheartedly and completely in eschatology. Completely. I think they're way off base. Like the all-millennial position. There is no millennium. There's no kingdom on earth at all. The word thousand doesn't mean thousand in Revelation 20. Okay. Yeah, I disagree with that. Completely. you got to run off to figurative language to resolve these issues with your doctrine. And I don't think we should be resolving issues with doctrine by symbolizing them away. Um, I think if there's a conflict, we might think about it, pray about it, and back it up a few feet and take another run at the text that we're in and be deferential with the text and the way we exegete with our hermeneutics and apply the same hermeneutic that we do elsewhere in the scripture 
with our eschatology. Um, unfortunately, um, many are of a school of thought where they say, well, there's a different class of um, a genre uh, in uh, the Bible. And this genre is called apocalyptic language or apocalyptic writings. So anything that we're going to apply as figurative, the way we back out of uh, um, having to confront this and argue the point or whatever, is we just kind of take this chunk out, find that little box where it says apocalyptic, and boom, it's in the apocalyptic box now. That means I don't have to deal with it because it's symbolic. Um, and and I, I think that's lazy. <clears throat> I reject that there is, and a lot of dispensationalists, I might add too, will refer to apocalyptic language and they'll say well, apocalyptic language is anything that has to do with the end time. Well, it, broadly speaking, if you want to apply it that way and use it in, in the proper context of the, the, what the word apocalypse means, you can do that. The apocalypse is the unveiling, the revelation of Jesus Christ, apocalypsis. So if you say that, that apocalyptic language is all things that have to do with the revelation of Jesus Christ in the very end of days. I'm there with you on that. But if you want to create a genre so you can say that everything that I don't like that has to do with the end of days that I think might have already happened or whatever and I don't feel like dealing with because I think it's figurative language, where's my box, my, my apocalyptic box, Whew. and you want to throw it down in there? Sorry, you lost me. You completely lost me. What is your precedence for sorting those out and exegeting scripture differently from the rest of scripture. Um, yes, there's symbolism in the Bible. Yes, there's metaphor in the Bible. Um, and uh, there's hyperbole in the Bible. Hyperbole is, in case you don't know or you're not sure how I'm using it, hyperbole is exaggerative language to make a point. If I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times. That's hyperbole. Um, my mom, if I have to tell you one more time to take, to take the trash out, I'm going to slap you in the middle of next week. Hyperbolic language. Uh, there is a lot of hyperbolic language in Hebrew writings. So we want to address some of those, take a look at them, and um, address those. Let's be respectful, please. And let's take a look at these and tell me what you think. I'm going to say right off at the, at the head because of some of the comments I'm getting. Please don't talk down to me and talk down to each other. That's Don't be condescending. It's really, it's considered rude. Um, I get these people all the time. Well, you, should, you need to go back and you need to read the book of Revelation. You should read. You really should read this. You need to go back. You, I think you need to study this right here. Um, please. You know, I... I feel like Paul, when he's writing to the Corinthians, saying, don't, don't, don't make me tell you all my, I was trained by Gamaliel. You know, I, I was a Roman citizen. I was a Jew of all Jews. I was a, a Pharisee. I, you know, Paul, and he's like, don't force me to, you know, give my CV. And I, I want to do the same thing here. You know, I've, I've, I came to know Christ back in 1971 while I was in junior high. Um, yes, I'm that old. Um, I've been so, Shortly thereafter, I got into eschatology, didn't know what to look for, but I started down that road over 50 years ago and have um, listened to a lot of cassette tapes. Remember those? Uh, listened to a lot of sermons, read many books, um, went to uh, a lot of different um, churches and things with different pastors and speakers and heard a lot of things, had many discussions with people. Mostly the most important thing is I've had my nose in the book and I've had to compare things that I thought I knew that I um, figured out that maybe I don't have correct because it just doesn't fit. I, you know, and um, some things I thought I understood and that I was told early on in my faith, which happens to most of us. So early in my faith, I learned some cer certain things and heard some certain things. I'm sure you could probably think of some too. That come to find out as I'm reading scripture, I said, wait a minute, that? Ah, that doesn't make sense. There was a time when I literally, and I tell this story before, uh, many times, when I literally sat down at my dinner table and I rolled out a big giant 
white piece of butcher paper, and I started charting things out with a, a gum eraser and a, a pencil, and I started trying to line some things out. And figured out, no, that doesn't, that timing doesn't work here. Where am I missing this? So I had to go to some Old Testament passages, look at my cross-references in my Bible, get out my Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, and find out, you know, examine this and some lexicons. So all this study, and, and after a while, I started applying a lot of the study to um, some uh, seminary courses and so forth. And eventually, I ended up getting a degree. Degree doesn't necessarily mean anything. I, I earned um, a, a master's degree in theology, but there are a lot of people who are masters in whatever and doctors in whatever who we know are completely untrustworthy. We know that that is worth the piece of paper it's written on, right? So that doesn't necessarily mean anything, but it just... Say, I'm just saying this not to be condescending. I'm just saying, please don't be condescending to me. Like, I've never read this stuff and heard the things that you're proposing before. Oh, maybe I haven't, because some people can come up with some really unique things that are like, what? That make me really scratch my head. Um, but uh, I won't be, here's a, a deal, a handshake deal, okay? Here we go. I won't be condescending to you if you don't be condescending to me. Please, let's just be iron sharpening iron. And uh, let's get into the scripture and take a look at these things and uh, try to sort some things out. There are some things I might be a dummy about. And I might say some things and misspeak some things. Misspeaking is likely. Um, and I've, this thing has been going on for this last month where I'm talking about the Jews scattering. I think I shared in a couple of videos. It's just driving me crazy lately. And I and I I keep talking about the first time they were scattered. And I, I keep talking about them coming into the land, and I keep talking about Egypt. And maybe because I have in my mind Egypt and coming into the land, and I've been thinking a lot about the borders of Israel and where they're at. And Israel has been in its borders off and on through history, but it has never had all of its borders. So I'm I'm thinking in terms of some of those prophecies, and I'm thinking about Egypt. So I keep saying Egypt. But when they were scattered before, it was Babylon, okay? It's Babylon. I know it's Babylon. I'm sorry. Forgive me. But I keep misspeaking. I keep saying Egypt. But they were enslaved um, before um, by Babylon, and so they were taken out of the land. And then 70 years later, um, they got to come back into the land. Uh, the Bible talks repeatedly about, I will bring you back into the land a second time. And this is some Old Testament prophecies. and and there was no second time they were even scattered until after 70 AD. Then they were scattered. And uh, they tried to come back in about 135. And uh, the emperor kicked them out again and said, no, go away. And set the Roman soldiers into plowing under Jerusalem. And um, they decided, let's just, we'll take care of that. This is no longer Israel. This isn't your land. Go away. Um, and they, that's why they called it Palestine. Historically, there was no country with Palestine. This was kind of established by an emperor to get rid of Israel, to get rid of the Jews. So they scattered to the nations. They scattered to all the countries. Prophetically, in the Old Testament, there's a lot about the Lord bringing them back in from all the countries. That never happened in history. He says, I'm going to bring you back into a desert land, and it's going to become a garden. And I will never scatter you again. You will never be uprooted again, all kinds of language like that. And you will dwell with your father's dwelt or you will you will walk where your feather, fathers walked forever and ever that kind of language repeatedly um and so um this is all by introduction by the way um just to couch the terms and what i'm looking for and what i expect to reveal and get into in in this little series of um of scripture in matthew 24 matthew 23 matthew 25 and going in a couple of verses into Matthew 26, if you look, Jesus is still speaking on the Mount of Olives, a couple of verses. Into, the chapters are not inspired. The chapter breaks, okay? The verses are not inspired. So, you know, sometimes when they break them, it's not doesn't always make the best sense. But, you know, it, it is what it is, and they are what they are now. So, with that, I'm going to um, stop this video here, and then we will launch into um, take a quick look at 23 and roll into chapter 24. I just wanted to tell you where we're headed and why we're headed there and give you a little background. Okay.